let me get to my top five reasons why your spousal sponsorship is rejected. Number one, the sponsor is ineligible. Now, I'm not going to go into a great length. Um, well, I'm not going to take a lot. Let's just put it this way. I'm not going to go into a long period of time as to what I, I, what I mean by that. But there are a number of factors that can cause you to be ineligible as a sponsor. Everything from as little as you're under 18 years of age to you've had prior criminality to you are not financially able to support your the person you're sponsoring. Maybe you have another undertaking with some, someone else that's in the queue. Maybe you've just maybe you've been the subject of of immigration enforcement or there's been something else. I'm pretty sure you guys aren't in jail or anything like that. <laughs> but the reality is <clears throat> many people don't realize that they're ineligible to sponsor. And then they go through the whole process, waste months and months only to realize that lo and behold, if they had waited just a little bit longer or corrected whatever the problem was, one other that I'll put in there is child support. If you're outstanding child support or, or um, spousal support payments, if they are behind or you're delinquent, that can also make you ineligible. And I see that a lot. So that's number one. Number two on my list is the applicant is ineligible. Well, under what circumstances are they ineligible? Well, right off the bat, criminality is one of them. If you've had a DUI in another country or something like that, um, there, are, there are a lot of different reasons in which an, applica an applicant themselves or the person being sponsored can be ineligible. And uh, maybe they've had some prior trouble with immigration, right? Maybe they have been deported in the past. We've seen that. But prior problems with immigration, uh, criminal issues, um, medical isn't an issue as much, although if there is communicable diseases and things like that, that can also make an applicant ineligible. So you want to identify this because you'll waste tons of time um, submitting an application that's doomed for failure if you don't realize these issues. Okay, number three, this never would have ever been on my list, let alone number three incomplete forms who would even think that that was an issue in the old days the glory days the good old days when i started practicing it was so frustrating to me because i would go to unbelievable lengths to make sure my applications were perfect and correct and i knew other representatives would submit a crappy application they wouldn't care how perfect it was. They wouldn't go over the forms very carefully because they knew immigration was going to send them back um, a request uh, for additional information or to correct deficiencies in the application. And so it rewarded crappy representatives and I hated it. Well, maybe I've got something that I, you know, I, I kind of wanted, but maybe I shouldn't have wanted it because now the slightest error on an application form can cause immigration to return it. In fact, I have seen people who failed to put a postal code of a family member that wasn't even coming with them to Canada for their address or a zip code on the residence, on, on their actual residential address in the form. They didn't put a postal code in and immigration returned it. Can you imagine? I don't even get me started with how finicky they are. So if missing information is a problem on the forms, Obviously, number four is going to be missing documents. And these can come in so many different ways. So many different ways. And, you know, I can see an officer. I can see these officers who are overrun. The pandemic has not released its grasp on us. These officers are still crammed in their homes, working on these tiny little laptops, trying to process applications that have been scanned in because that's another issue. Although the PR portal is open, personally, I don't touch it with a 10-foot pole yet. Not until they sort it out. So paper-based applications continue to be the way that I'm going to go just because I can guarantee that things are not going to get screwed up and I have more flexibility to add other information in, not worrying about space or, or file sizes or things like that because you can not take chances. I can see this officer squinting at her screen, looking at this lengthy, voluminous sized document that she's trying to work through, and she's just getting super frustrated. 
And she knows that she's got this pressure from the government saying, we need to process these applications. And she's sitting there and she's thinking to herself, my goodness, look at this application. There is so much in it. And then she spots something. She spots a missing piece of information or she spots a missing document that is listed on the checklist, but the candidate didn't include. And she's like, ha, all right, there's my out. I can check this off as a processed application because I am going to send them back a rejection letter saying that they're missing this document. And off it goes, the application is sent back and the officer can then move on to another one. That unfortunately, folks, is the world that we're in. But then I want you to picture something different, okay? I want you to picture this same officer and now she's looking at an application that isn't missing incomplete forms or missing documents. And she's going through the application and she's going through a checklist and the application is all organized exactly how she would want it. And she's zipping through it, check, 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 check. Everything's in place. She's feeling pretty happy. And she says to herself, wow, this is, this is the best application I have seen all day. I'm going to get this one out approved and let this applicant know because they just made my life easier. Every once in a while, this fifth reason pops up. And I probably don't even need to put it in here, you guys, but I will. Misrepresentation. Some of you are tempted to take a little bit of money from someone to sponsor them as a spouse in something we call a marriage of convenience. The government now calls it a relationship of convenience, but it's always been a mock. And that's basically where individuals know that the relationship really isn't genuine, but the applicant or the person being sponsored is willing to do anything for you to support them. Please, please avoid that situation like the plague. It can not only get you into trouble, but just cause problems for you for the rest of your life. And so sometimes people misrepresent on their applications. And it's not always, you guys, the fact that they it's a marriage of convenience. Sometimes people have received some horrible advice from someone that they shouldn't disclose something, right? That they shouldn't say something um, in the form like a prior visa refusal um, because for fear that it will cause the application to get rejected. And in essence, they're making matters worse because of the misrepresentation. So that is my five top reasons your spousal sponsorship application can get rejected. And knowing this, knowing the current state of immigration, that is why I created this. And all you need to do right now, there is still space and there's still time for you to get into it and you can register for it. And the link is in the description below. And I would love for you guys to join me as we embark on this brand new course from the Canadian Immigration Institute, which is all about sponsoring your spouse.